Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Creoptics AG, I'd like to welcome you to Gathering Evidence Through Biochemical and Biophysical Characterization of Biologics. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Dr. Sean C. Owen, PhD, Assistant Professor, Pharmaceutical Chemistry Department, University of Utah. Our second speaker is Dr. Ellen Lee, PhD, Field Application Specialist with Creoptics AG. Welcome, Dr. Owen. The presenter ball is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm excited to be here. Welcome, everybody. I would say good morning, but I don't know where everybody is, so good afternoon or good evening, whatever is most appropriate. Um, I think that many of us can empathize with the idea that we've become experts in almost all uh, online platforms, be it Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Meetings. And I find myself at a little bit of a disadvantage this time because I can't see everybody. So maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, but I, I'm happy to present and please ask questions at the end for anything that I might be able to fill you in on. I'm going to tell you kind of two different stories that, that are growing in the lab right now. Some of the work that we've done over the last year or two and some things that are, are very recent. One of the main goals in, our, in my laboratory is to uh, look at high level characterization, very deep dives into characterization of biomacromolecules. And you'll notice from the title that I that I borrowed a term from the FDA, this developing totality. That comes from the FDA's idea of totality of the evidence. This is mostly referring to biosimilars, but for me it's always this really interesting question of what else can we do to look at biomacromolecules? And, and especially in some cases, does it matter? So just a quick reminder for antibody structure, uh, some of the terminology that I might use today, IgG is the most common type of therapeutic antibody. I will use the term FAB that, that talks about the antibody fragment that binds. I'll also probably mention the FC domain, which is important for many of the, the uh, activities of an antibody. As many of you know, antibodies are, are a major therapeutic modality uh, that have found use in, in a number of different diseases. Uh, what we're really interested in my lab are not just antibodies, but what we can do to them. And one of the really intriguing formats are antibody drug conjugates. Uh, and as, as you are aware, an antibody drug conjugate is a large macromolecule and it is a small molecule together. And these are combined through different types of linkers, different kinds of chemical conjugation, and carry different payloads. Right now, in that are approved by the FDA in the United States, there are eight products. And you can see I've listed these kind of two different bins. And these are based on how the payload and the linker is conjugated onto the antibody. So on the left-hand side, uh, we have a typical IgG that has, uh, there's usually 90, approximately 90 lysine residues on most IgGs. And this is important because uh, you can see in that left-hand column all of the different kinds of payloads that have been conjugated uh, through linkers to these lysines. And that gives a very interesting question about where the drug is located, how many of these drugs are on a given antibody. Um, for the other most common uh, type of conjugation we see is through disulfide bridges. Uh, in, in a typical, in an IgG, there are four interchain and eight intrachain disulfides. Uh, the intrachain are hard to reduce, but the interchain reduce quite readily. Once these are reduced, you can do chemistry on those free thiols, and there are four products that use this chemistry. And this does help localize the drug to specific locations, but we still do have a distribution in the number of drugs that are on, uh, that, that are distributed throughout a product. I'm going to focus really hard on the, on the first type and actually looking at some comparisons that we've done to one of the earliest uh, antibody drug conjugates, um, that is trastuzumab and tamzine which we also call trastuzumab DM1. And one thing that we were curio curious in my lab very early is different ways to do this conjugation. Uh, I know this is a busy slide, but if you'd like to look at the specifics of this, please refer to the paper that's at the bottom of the page. Um, what, what I refer to as offbeat and onbeat are two different synthetic strategies for conjugation. The typical way that these antibodies are made are in solution. And these antibody drug conjugates uh, are 
completely in a buffer and the drug is added in that solution and then has to be purified by an FPLC or some other mechanism. Um, for another approach that we've been working on is an on bead. And in this way, a protein A is conjugated onto a magnetic bead and then trastuzumab or any other antibodies is mobilized onto that protein A through affinity and then conjugation is performed. And this really enables us to do quite low volumes and quite low uh, levels of antibody uh, for our purposes. So we can test out a bunch of different conditions before having to move to larger volumes and larger concentrations um, for the in solution. But the question immediately arises, do you get the same product from these two different approaches? So for, and, and the reason that the one, one potential confounding factor is because of protein A binding itself. So if we look at the crystal structure I have here, this is protein A in the, in the fab domain. And even within the fab domain, um, there is at least one binding site where it, it almost overlaps with some of the lysine residues that we commonly see uh, conjugated with drug. This is also true in the FC domain, um, where there's lysines that potentially uh, will be blocked if the protein A is first bound to that antibody. So we wanted to look at it, it, if this is actually true. So comparing side by side, um, the off bead versus the on bead approach, we wanted to look at the overall distribution of the, the antibody uh, the antibody ratio. So we call this is the DAR, this is the drug to antibody ratio. And if you look at this distribution, this kind of a mirror plot, what we see on the top is the off bead. And we do see a very uh, heterogeneous distribution. This is reproducible heterogeneity, so it is acceptable, um, but it is a, a distribution of different levels of conjugation throughout uh, the product. And you can see that looking at the mirror plot from the off bead compared to the on bead, you see a very close uh, resemblance between the two. The on bead has a slightly higher DAR uh, than the other, and we think this is mostly from the contribution of some of the intermediate DAR species, the DAR3 and DAR4. And so we do start to see a little subtle difference here and we start to ask ourselves, okay, so even at this level, this very uh, kind of gross level, we can see a difference between these two and does it make any difference? But the first thing we wanted to ask is, you know, where are these differences coming from? Is there a change in the location of the drug on, that, on the normal distribution of the antibody? And so through peptide mapping that we've done, as well as uh, other people have done, and we actually looked at the individual lysines that are conjugated with drug. And these are the most common sites that we see uh, on this at the bottom of the graph. Uh, these are the different lysines that are numbered based on uh, conventional uh, numbering of the trastuzumab. For more specifics, again, refer to that paper. What we do see is where you can see these asterisks. These are the locations where there is a slight difference in, uh, in the distribution of offbeat compared to onbeat. And I really want to draw your attention to this one, K65. This is where we see one of the more dramatic drops in the location. What's interesting is the crystal structure that I showed you was actually looking at K65, which is the exact location of protein A binding. So we do think that that interference is likely because of protein A uh, interfering with at least some of the antibody bound to the resin, as well as down in this region where we do have some overlap or proximity to the protein A that might bind in the FC domain. So moving on, uh, the question then becomes where most people use protein A or protein G or protein L is not in conjugation, but more in purification. So think of it in a different way. If we were able to first conjugate a drug and it happened to be on one of the lysines that's proximal to one of these proteins, will it have an effect on the purification? So what we did is we looked at um, purifying, taking the in solution antibody drug conjugate that we made and then purifying it using a protein A column, uh, infinity column. And so this is looking at side-by-side -side comparison of the product distribution that we get when we use an SEC column, so the size exclusion chromatography. We used a Cephidex G50 uh, for this purification. It's a common desalting column. And you can see the, the nice distribution that we obtained by mass spectrometry. And if you look at the difference between that and the red, which shows the purification that we obtained after protein A affinity chromatography. I really want to draw your attention out to these high DAR species, so out around seven and eight, where we do still see some levels of the, the conjugate in a normal SEC purification, but we see almost none of those from a protein A affinity purification. 
So not only does the conjugation make a difference, but it looks like the purification can actually have a, a shift in the distribution of drug that you are getting um, in your final product. The real question though is, does it matter? And I think this is an important question. Just because we can show a difference, does it have any functional effect on our antibody drug conjugates? Um, one way that we looked at this was through uh, stability studies. Um, we did a, several different studies. Um, one of these is highlighted here, um, where we looked at DLS, uh, look at temperature-related aggregation. Uh, I think it's well known that uh, conjugating a drug to an antibody does have a major impact on stability of the macromolecule. And we do see that the blue is the trastuzumab, and the purple and green are the offbeat and onbeat respectively. And so what you do see is that the difference almost immediately we see a average diameter difference between the antibody and the antibody drug conjugate. This is what we've and many other people have reported. What is interesting is highlighted inside this red box where we start to see a shift. And zooming in on that region, this is where we start to see um, a difference. There's a, a significant difference between the trastuzumab and the trastuzumab DM1 conjugates. And so both of these, you start to see a, an initial unfolding event that's leading to likely some kind of aggregation. At least a, a, this isn't a complete precipitation yet, but there is some kind of aggregation that is occurring. What's important to note, though, is these are almost completely overlapped with their uh, deviation. So although there is a slight difference in the trend, the overall difference is probably not significant. We also looked at ITC as a way to measure the binding of ADCs to the target ligand. One thing that we wanted to check was if these antibodies can still bind to their target HER2, which is the, the novel receptor for this type of antibody. And we looked at looking at the ITC, we used a nano ITC instrument from TA Instruments and looking at the interaction between these two molecules. What's important is, to, is these curves that were fit and gives us these kind of results where we're looking at the equilibrium constant uh, between trastuzumab and each one of these different derivatives. And we can see that within statistical error, there's no difference in the binding between trastuzumab and the off-bead or the on-bead. So kind of a conclusion from that part is that we do see minor differences for the, the drug to antibody ratio and also the distribution of where those drugs are located in our final products. Um, however, we find no statistical difference found in, the, in physical chemical analysis. Uh, what I showed you, the DSC, we also did Rama spectroscopy, but you can look back to that original publication, as well as others. And uh, ITC, we do see minor differences in the products, and they are dependent on conjugation chemistry, different phase, how these are done, if they're on beat or off beat, and purification. However, I would say that so far we have not seen any, any functional differences between these antibody drug conjugate methods. So another question that we started to play with very late is after looking at storage of some of these antibody drug conjugates, we found that what we had been originally using was the same buffer that's used for trastuzumab. Um, and we were curious how much of a difference that makes in, in, in the stability of these antibody drug conjugates. And so with cooperation from Redshift Bio, this is a, a differential absorbance spectra. So what we're looking at here is the absorbance spectra for each of these different, these this is the trastuzumab DM1 that was formed on bead only. But what we have now are two different buffer uh, conditions. One of them is the triolose buffer that is reported for trastuzumab. And the second is the succinate buffer that is actually the real buffer used in the trastuzumab DM1 clinical formulation. And so in my lab, originally we've been using this triolose formulation for all of our antibody drug conjugates. After noticing some odd behavior, we switched to the succinate buffer that is used by the, you know, like, as I mentioned, the clinical formulation. So what we're looking at here is the, the absorbance of these different antibody drug conjugates compared to the reference of, of the, uh, the background here is the control. Um, this is just the buffers by themselves. And then looking at the absorbance um, over, over a, a range looking for any kind of secondary structure changes. And so we have trastuzumab DM1 in the succinate buffer, and here is the trastuzumab triolose buffer. And here we have the triolose uh, buffer of the trastuzumab compared to the control. Now, if you move on to the next slide, what we see is the succinate buffer compared to the trastuzumab triolose buffer. 
and the trastuzumab uh, triolose buffer. So the overlap is, is almost complete with the succinate form of trastuzumab-1 and the trastuzumab triolose buffer, these two lines here. And we looked at the similarity of the replicates. So after doing this multiple injections, trying to see how reproducible this is, and what we found is that the reproducibility from, from injection to injection was very high for trastuzumab um, for each one of these. So the result that we're getting is consistent over each injection. I think a bigger question is, what is the difference between each one of these? And so we really wanted to look at some specific uh, absorption spectra that we found kind of a little bit erroneous. And these particular uh, wavelengths, 1689, 1639, 1614, are all indicative of beta sheets. And if you look at the blue line compared to the other two, you'll notice a deviation. So what we have is these two, the, tr the trastuzumab DM1 in succinate buffer and the trastuzumab DM1 in trio, and the trastuzumab in triolose buffer are nearly identical. But there's a pretty dramatic shift in the trastuzumab in the DM1 in the triolose buffer. You see these at each one of these points. Taking the delta of the second derivative, we really are able to exaggerate this. These bottom two show any different deviations within normal range. Again, this very high level of deviation of the trastuzumab DM1, DM1 in trihalose buffer. So what that tells us is that there is a very likely difference in the structure of the in, in the trihalose buffer for the DM1. And this is most likely tracked back because of the, the shift in these three different wavelengths. Most likely is a change in the beta sheet that is happening within the antibot. Um, Again, we do see those differences between each one of these, and this just shows how much of a, of a derivation we have for each different molecule. Uh, and so I think in the conclusion, the succinate buffer and the original trastuzumab look very similar, but the trilose buffer DM1 does have major deviations. So it's the second consideration that we really need to look at is, is the buffer conditions, at least for stability. Now the question really comes back to, does this make a difference in the functionality of the antibody. And one way that we look at this very quickly is with binding. And so with a recent collaboration that we're excited about with Preoptics, looking at um, this technology that you're going to hear a lot more about in a few minutes, created a couple of uh, interferometry to measure binding. And so first, HER2 was a mean coupled onto a chip. Um, and Ellen will speak much more about this technology. We do see a very high level of binding of the HER2 to the chip. And then the second is to look at the flow of the trastuzumab or the TDM1. Uh, again, this is in the succinate buffer. We wanted to make sure that the binding remains the same. What we find is that the, the KD for both of these is very, very similar. And that's exactly what we want to see is that there's no major perturbation in the binding between trastuzumab and the modified version. So although we do see, again, a shift in the structure, um, and I think this is one of the first times people have really looked at it, the secondary structure of an antibody drug conjugate, looking at that difference, it is there. Um, we do see a shift in that beta sheet, but so far we have not seen any functional difference um, between those two, uh, between the original parent trastuzumab and the trastuzumab DM1. So in conclusion from the second portion, uh, I think that I would say the buffer composition does affect secondary structure and it definitely impacts stability. Um, we'd see that very readily with uh, precipitation so much precipitation in the triolose buffer for trastuzumab DM1 that we can't even ship it to a collaborator in solution form. Um, but the succinate buffer remains much more stable. Uh, the binding is comparable between trastuzumab and the uh, trastuzumab DM1. And changes in the beta sheet are the most likely structural change that are amplified from poor storage conditions. So in conclusion, I'd really like to thank uh, members of my group, uh, Christine and Sam and Keith, uh, that have worked really hard on this, and Jessica and Sunjin and Andy and myself that uh, are, are present. I'd really like to give a shout out again to collaborators, long-term collaborators, uh, John Gebler and Colette Quinn at Waters and TA Instruments, and new collaborators that I'm excited to work with, uh, Jeffrey Zonderman and Lee Bol Wong at Redshift, and Yelemi Galinda, Galindo and uh, Ronnie Namey at Preoptics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. And now we'll turn it over to our second presenter for today, Dr. Ellen Lee. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thanks, Elizabeth. Sean very kindly walked us through some of what goes on in terms of biophysical characterization and how that affects biologics. 
what I hope to discuss in the second portion of our chat today is just to kind of give you an idea of some of the other types of measurements, other kind of applications that is possible with the GCI technology that Sean utilized in sort of his trusted map measurement. So when we think about looking at measurements, trying to decide what's an important molecule, be it small or biologic to develop, we think about measurements of affinity, but there's also the consideration of kinetics. As we think about something moving through the process from hit to lead to hopefully a final drug, as we think about affinity versus kinetics, as we think about the development of a drug processes, affinity is a really good place to start, but kinetics also comes into play because we can think about affin affinities is that ratio of that both K-on and K-off, and you can have multiple drugs, multiple candidates with the same affinity, but it is quite possible for them to have different kinetics, and that's sort of illustrated for us here on the right-hand side, and it's with simulated data. I just always find it a little easier to think about things visually, and when we look at that right-hand side, we do see that they have quite different kinetics, even though all three in purple, green, and teal, blue, have essentially the same affinities. Today in particular, I'll just be presenting a bit on the Creoptics wave system. And to fit with today's sort of discussion, we'll be discussing sort of more case application samples to do with sample robustness and the types of samples and matrices that the instrument can help you evaluate projects in. But to start with, we should always discuss a little bit about what's the underpinnings of the technology. And in this case, I find it useful to discuss sort of how we're able to have sensitive measurements by discussing the waveguide interferometry to begin with. For a lot of people, it's useful to think about this in comparison to surface plasma resonance or SPR, since a lot of biophysicists are very familiar with the technique. SPR works by having a light shown on the back of a thin gold surface, and we are looking at that total reflection angle. Part of that light generates an evanescent wave or, you know, the plasma on the top side of the gold where the sample is. In this case of the cartoon on the left-hand side, we're looking at an antibody antigen with the antibody mobilized to the surface. This means that when we are looking at the spectrum of the reflective light, there is going to be a negative peak, a dip at a certain wavelength. The plasma on the top side is going to be sensitive to the refractive index of what's above that surface. With that proper referencing, the refractive index changes can be converted to mass bound on a surface. When we have a refractive index change, for example, antibody binds to its antigen, we have a change that we can then detect. When we are talking about waveguide interferometry, which is going to be illustrated on the right-hand side of the slide, it is going to be similar. There is an evanescent wave that's generated by light and sensitive to the refractive index on the surface. Therefore, we can also use this to measure mass differences. One of the major differences that I really like about this cartoon, which I think is nice to illustrate here, is that with waveguide interferometry, the light is traveling inside a waveguide and under the surf sensor surface. Um, I think about it kind of like a foptic fiber situation. Because of this, the evanescent wave here um, kind of travels along that surface and isn't static. This means that, practically speaking, with waveguide interferometry, the waves feel a lot more of interactions on that surface than SPR plasma. It's part of what makes waveguide interferometry more sensitive than SPR. However, classic waveguide interferometers do suffer from some stability issues. And here at Creoptics, we've sort of figured out our way around it so that we can take advantage of the sensitivity. So with Creoptics grading coupled interferometry technology, what we've done is to take the light that's utilized in waveguide interferometry and we couple the light in through the grading. So now rather than having 
two different light paths that would eventually cross in, in old inspirometers, which was due to drifts from vibration temperature changes. Um, by having them travel in the same waveguide, we remove the possibilities, we remove the causes for any data drift. So that's why this, is, this technology is GCI, short for grading coupled interferometry. We've taken the waveguide interferometry, we've made it We've made the data readouts much more stable, giving us the ability to access that higher stability possible. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, in order to follow up from the wonderful presentation from Sean, we're going to discuss some different applications, different case studies in terms of what can the wave do in for your crude sample measurements. Part of what makes crude sample measurements possible in different types of bioliquids and matrices like sera, plasma, or cell supernatant is the design of the wave chip consumables. What we're seeing on the top right-hand side is going to be a zoom, very zoomed-in picture of what that wave chip surface looks like with the in-out of the buffer waste ports, as well as looking at what we looking at sort of that surface grading. That gradings there can also be seen. So because we have removed a lot of the integrated microfluidics, it really does help with preventing clogs as well as thus giving us the confidence to work with things like Sierra. In this first diagnostic case study, what we are looking at here is looking at antibody profiling in serum. For sandwich assay diagnostics application, it becomes important to think about, and as Sean touched on earlier, behavior in different buffers and, you know, perhaps even in Sierra later. Here on this particular slide, what we're showing is looking at antibody behavior in two particular, two different antibody behaviors, looking at the kinetics data for in buffer and in serum. We're showing buffer on the left-hand side and serum up to 90% on the right-hand side. If we were purely evaluating these two different antibodies based on buffer-only situation, looking at that top and bottom on the left-hand side in buffer, we would see that, yeah, you know, we both have, they both demonstrate binding to the antigen in particular. They both seem to have a good response. In this particular case, we might have gotten a kind of misleading bit of data in terms of which antibody to continue development. Because the moment we move these antibody sets to serum applications, shown here on the right-hand side, we can show that the top antibody still demonstrates excellent binding. However, the second antibody on the bottom row in serum does not demonstrate the appropriate binding that we are looking for. So in this particular case, it was very helpful to be able to have this kinetic information to be able to work in the serum because ultimately that's likely what it will be used for for these sort of diagnostics applications. That's what the original liquid will be in from then on. A second diagnostic case study I want to touch on briefly is to the thinking about looking at peptide binding to antibody. Here what we had was AP1 antibody as well as a negative control AP1. These were both coupled to the surface of the sensor in two different conditions. On the top row of the data shown, we're showing the, we're showing it with a high density coupled on the surface. On the bottom row, we're showing a sort of low density situation. What we found in this case was that in the injection of the peptide and looking at the binding to antibody, we got excellent data out of this, um, even in a low density situation. We did see that there was some nonspecific binding on our negative control AP1, which was um, immobilized on channel three. And then that's why in this particular case, what we did was reference out that 
negative control antibody, negative, sorry, negative control AP1 on channel 3. It does become important, I think, to always think about what is the design of your experiment and which part of your ligand analyte becomes a portion immobilized to a surface. Um, internal data, um, this was done with HEP scan. They saw a different affinity in the 40 nanomolar range. What we are likely to see in this case with a difference in KD is that there is likely because we essentially reversed the approach in terms of which of the pairs we immobilize to a surface. Extending further from the work with PEP scan was to then also look at binding in serum because ultimately that is sort of where they want to take these therapeutic peptides. So what we did in this case was to continue the same setup as before by looking at either the antibody or the negative control aiming coupled on the surface, and then we did the analysis in either buffer with ESA or in 50% serum. What we found in this case was that we had, again, really nice data. Um, BSA makes for a really nice, let's say, sort of first round testing before we kind of jump to try to get Sierra. That's always something I would recommend thinking about if someone does want to begin developing an assay um, in different bioliquids. That's always kind of a nice first step to think about. Um, and then we also looked at the same binding situation in that 50% serum. The first situation helps us develop and work on the second situation, which is in serum. What we found in this case was that we matched really nicely with the CLIPS technology here in looking at that KD we get back out in the micromolar range. So I think this is always something really exciting to think about, the ability to begin to look at something in that, in more of a physiologically relevant environment rather than a pure buffer. Another sort of case I want to present here was done um, by Melogic. For them, they had a need here in this case to think about what are the best pairs of antibody in terms of looking at the P24 protein from HIV and how do we have, how can we get a best binding, best therapeutics here possible? If we look at and follow this diagram here, what we're looking at is we're kind of, they first are showing what that P24 and there's two different antibodies here that, we're thinking, that we want to think about. And maybe two in green along the top, and a maybe one in blue along the bottom. What the group did here was to measure the affinity of the antibody to antigen, as well as want to understand, you know, with this affinity, with these two different antibodies, is there a way to augment the situation? because practically speaking, the strongest possible binding means that we likely have a better sensitivity in terms of targeting that exact HIV P24 molecule. When we look at the pair kinetics, here what was done was measuring the P24 antibody pairs when MAB1 binds to either a complex of MAB2 to P24, or we look at MAB1 plus P24 complex, and then bind antibody 2. So bear with me. I'll try to take us through this slide one by one because we do have a lot happening here. And this is a small part of all the work at Melogic, and we've been really happy to, you know, work with them to help identify antibody antigen for their lateral flow test development. So on the left-hand side, what we're looking at here is MAB1 binding to already complex MAB2 P24. So here we're seeing a very tight KD, a very strong KD at 6.8 picomolar. This is actually stronger significantly than the situation we have on the right-hand side, which would be 
MAB1 and P24 complex, and then binding MAB2. So this helps us to actually think about, and this helps James Shelton, the principal scientist in Melogic, begin thinking about, is there a sequence order that's important as we think about these two different antibodies in a context of working functioning together in their lateral flow assays? Is there an order things should be paired in to help us have better sensitivity, um, better able to measure things at low concentrations? Not only are we involved in help pushing forward research um, looking at lateral flow, we are also very excited to be cooperating with a lab at the University of Zurich. Um, in this particular case, they want to look at therapeutics that may be of interest in addressing the current global pandemic of SARS-CoV-2. Here they wanted to understand what's happening with different side bodies and which are the most going to be the most relevant in addressing the affinity to the spike protein. For the sake of space, we're not showing the full off rate screen of a total of 57 side bodies. For those unfamiliar with side bodies, they're synthetic single domain antibodies. So we first screen together with uh, the ETH Zurich, University of Zurich lab. We are showing a screen of the single domains against the spike protein. And from there, we had six particular very tight binders. Here we are defining that as affinity tighter than that of 200 nanomolar. And from there, we wanted to characterize the full binding characterizations for two different epitodes, for either the spike RDB as well for the ECB. So what we're showing here is going to be um, side body 15, 42, 45, as well as 68. So that's just a small selection of what we did together, and we're, and we're seeing that these have all got pretty high affinities, and we're able to get really nice full binding kinetics. But then, of course, we really wanted to understand, are there antibodies that, are these antibodies, going, side bodies, going to recognize different epitopes, or do they recognize the same epitope? So what we're looking at here are side bodies alone as well as in combination. What we are showing here on the right-hand side are three different side bodies that actually appear to be recognizing the same epitopes on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The data here suggests that on the left-hand side, what we're showing is actually side body 15 and 26 appear to recognize different epitopes. That is, they can simultaneously bind to different epitopes on the SARS-CoV-2 spike, which is immobilized to the surface here in this case. And this could be of really interest to know that whether or not one side body alone or perhaps a combination of side bodies would be useful in any potential therapeutics that come up. So I hope that we've been able to kind of walk you through some different application ideas and some of the research that's currently being done on the WAVE system. Here I just kind of want to walk everybody through a little of what's involved in the WAVE system. The core on the left-hand side is where the sensors as well as the buffer reservoir goes. On the right-hand side, we have the WAVE sampler, which is a temperature control auto sampler for all the plates and vials of your samples that are going to be injected. All this is controlled via the WAVE control software as well as analysis is done in there. And then, as I mentioned a little bit before, when, before we started talking about crude sample handling, the w combination of wave chips and sensors into this one consumable gives the ability to look at, sensit have sensitivity, as well as look at crude samples, which is a major thing that people begin to sort of think about wanting as projects move forward.
there's been a number of publications utilizing a career optics wave, and I'm always really happy to discuss specific papers offline with anybody who's interested. And we've been really happy to be able to work with our different customers. You saw um, presentations from data from a number of the ones listed on this slide here. And we always aim to try to have an excellent tech support, and we will be answering questions. As Elizabeth mentioned, if we don't get through everything today, we'll be reaching out within the next several days to answer your questions individually. So hopefully today what we've discussed a little bit is how we're able to understand antibody performance in conditions closer to real life, show a little bit about how we enabled evaluation of antibody pairs for lateral flow assays, and the potential of the wave to accelerate development of therapeutics. So at this point, I'd just like to thank everyone for their attention. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Really happy about that. Um, we are going to, I believe, hand it back over to Elizabeth to moderate this. My email is on the slide at the bottom, elee at creoptics.com, if you want to directly address me. But we will be reaching out to you. We are seeing the questions that are coming in. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Yes, we do have quite a few questions. One to start with, it's coming in several forms. And that is, what's the throughput and sensitivity of the instrument? Sure. So when we talk about the throughput, I think it's easiest for me to jump back a couple of slides. And let's look at sort of that auto sampler in the back on the right-hand side, which is right behind the laptop. When we are looking at that auto sampler, that's actually got space for two racks. That is, we can have racks for 48 vials. We can handle 96 well plates or 384 well plates. So there's two spaces. So you could have 2x384 in that auto sampler. And then depending on the exact design, the throughput will vary based on like however many analogs you choose to put in. When we talk about the sensitivity, we're able to go into picomolar and down to millimolar range. And I'm happy to, for everyone who's asked about sensitivity, as Elizabeth mentioned, this did come up, come up several times. I think it'll be useful to send everybody with that, perhaps the spec sheet for the instrumentation. All right, perfect. Thank you. We have a question for Sean as well. Sean, the question is, do you mean that the HER2 FC chip cannot detect beta sheet change in the antibody? Yeah, I would say that the beta sheet change is not large enough to cause a, a difference in the binding affinity between the two antibodies. I think that if there was a complete disruption of the beta sheet, probably we would pick that up on the, on the Creoptics instrument. Uh, or other binding, uh, other binding assays. All right, thank you. Another one for you, Ellen. Could you comment on the Creoptics for bispecifics and whether or not there are avidity effects seen upon binding of individual antigens? So I think when we're talking about possible avidity effects, especially in particular for biophysics, that can get a little tricky. It's going to matter which portion we're going to be injecting, as well as the different, you know, like are we talking about peptides? Are we talking about proteins? Are we talking about a mix? I will say that, you know, I think one way to try to get around it, um, we didn't touch on that so much today, is the sensitivity of the instrument in terms of being able to sort of get really high quality data means that we can push down in terms of the amount of protein immobilized on the surface, how much less ligand we can, we can put on the surface and still get excellent results out. So that would definitely be one way to help lower the amount of avidity affecting your measurements. 
All right. Thank Realistically you. speaking, at some point, you're just going to have to do that empirical experiment. Uh, okay. um, it's science. Okay. A question that was addressed to both of you. What is the applicability of this technique for GPCRs or enzymes relative to small molecule ligands? So I can actually touch on that really quickly first. We've actually got a customer who has actually been doing a lot of GPCRs work relative to, and GPCR small molecule ligand work and has been quite happy with the type of data that we're, he's getting out. Um, in terms of what type of GPCR work, um, we find that it functions really nicely with purified GPCRs or even sort of a relatively crudely purified GPCRs, especially as we're talking about that membrane protein to a small molecule binding situation. Sean, do you have more to add on this? No, I think that's good. Thank you. We did have a question. What was the concentration of BSA on the PEP scan data? Concentration of BSA on the PEP scan data. Can I get back to you on that? I think I know roughly what it is, but I want to make sure to give you guys the accurate data in terms of what was performed in that particular assay. Our next question, which species is the immobilized partner in each of these interactions on the MoLogic data? Was this the one that, was this when that particular question came in, Elizabeth? Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Um, sorry if I'm wrong for responding. Um, so in this particular case, so in this particular case, we're looking at sort of different complex situations. I do believe that we are looking at injections of MIB-1 and with MIB-2 on that surface. And then either P24 binding either prior or after. Thank there you. There is an excellent poster from the logic, and if it's online, I will make sure to direct you to it. All right, and a follow-up question to that. What was immobilized? Thought I covered that, but if that was still in that was still unclear, I think the best would be to I will see where that poster is online and direct you to it, because right. this is a small part of, admittedly, a very large part of their lateral flow test development, and it's been really exciting to see that we can contribute to this sort of work. Excellent, thank you. Our next question from Arcana. How does serum antibody interference, or how is serum antibody interference in kinetics managed? I think the thing that really prevents and really makes things difficult in terms of thinking about serum applications is what's the sort of, what's your best control, right? That's always, I think, actually the most difficult part of a lot of these experimental designs as we start moving into more and more bioliquids. Um, for example, there's things that you always want to have the most appropriate negative control for. Um, say, if you're looking at something from a patient sample, you would also need excellent, well-defined, positive, and negative control. That's sort of really where I would start. There's just a lot of discussion before any of these get going in terms of what are trusted samples that we can develop off of because data is only as good as, I think, the controls you have. All right. Thank you. We have a question from who? What is the advantage of the WAVE system in comparison with ITC? So ITC is a lovely technology. It gets us a lot of different types of data, you know, especially if you're a researcher who's interested in things like, you know, what's the enthalpy, what's the entropy of a particular interaction. I do think that one of the things you have to be ready for as you do ITC is going to be the sheer amount of protein that's needed for several of the models, um, the exact volume varies depending on which instrument you're working on. But in general, unless you have access to something that is very automated, there's a lot of hands-on, hands-on time, and 
you can be kind of limited in terms of how many samples you can process in a single day versus the situation which is much more automated like a wave system where not only do we have that affinity, we do have, we do get that kinetics data. And after the preparation of all your samples, they go into the instrument. You have a nice amount of walkway time and come back to data that you can then go through and discuss and think, really think about how that guides your next experiment. Yeah, I would add just a, a little bit to that. I completely agree. It depends on what you're trying to find. I think that if it's just your binding affinity or the equi uh, uh, equilibrium constant, then uh, then I think that probably uh, the wave instrument is going to be a little bit more uh, direct, especially with the amount of material that you need to use. If you're looking for enthalpy and entropy, then ITC is definitely essential. Another consideration, so I, I completely agree, um, the amount of material that you need is going to be significantly different. Different. Uh, one thing to consider, though, is immobilized versus in solution. So if, if there is anything that happens from the mobilization or prevents the mobilization for the wave instrument, then ITC still is, is a, a very good alternative. So I think both have their advantages in the specifics of what you're trying to look at, I think is important. Thank you so much for your addition, Sean. There is sort of a lot of things to think about. I think in the end, it's why so many of us emphasize that, you know, there really needs to be complementary data from different types of measurements. Um, there's also a very rare occasion where there's no enthalpic change. Um, so in that case, you can measure with an ITC and you don't you still don't understand what the affinity is at the end but that's like a very rare you've gotten really unlucky with your project this year switch thank you mariana asks would this technology work with detecting binding kinetics of aavs or other viral vectors yeah so that is actually something that's quite possible because of the way the wave system is set up and it's able to handle things in different situation and even particle sizes up to a thousand nanometers. Um, we do have a couple examples of looking at virus-like particles or VLPs, which with that on the surface, looking at binding to the nova protein. So that is, that is going to be possible with this instrument that may not be as straightforward as others. All right, and we have time for just one more question as we're coming up on our end time. And this one is for you, Alan. Can you elaborate on some of the challenges you have when working with plasma and serum? So that's a really great question. The first one I've already touched on, so I won't belabor too much. One is going to always be accessibility, as well as how do we define and what do we set as our different controls so that we understand the data that's coming out, because inconclusive data is almost worse than anything, right? You have you have like, really interesting possibilities, but you don't know what to trust. The second thing is going to be challenges in terms of things like how much volume there is, the type of sample prep that may be required. If you're unfamiliar with handling it, sometimes there's, you know, you do need to do different types of filtering or centrifuges to get rid of any um, protein aggregates that may be in there. If there are things like clinical samples, there's also considerations about handling that too, right? It's going to be a bit different from just being able to work with buffers and this sort of um, handling situation of tracking different things. Those are also different challenges that scientists have had to really kind of add as they look at these experiments um, because moving into bioliquids has its benefits um, because of the level of complexity, but it does add a further level of complexity to their experiments. Excellent. Thank you so much. We do have quite a few more questions. I will be compiling those and sending them along to our presenters, and you'll be receiving your answers via email if we were not able to answer your question during today's event. So I'd like to again thank our presenters for today, Dr. Sean Owen and Dr. Ellen Lee. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Creoptics AG, for sponsoring today's event. Most of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming and spending this time with us. It's a very strange time, and we know you're very 
very busy, and we're very grateful you chose to come and spend this time with us. So on behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series, I'd like to thank you all again so very much and wish you all a great day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.